Chapter 31, Moment to Moment For a long time I imagined that my next book would be titled Moment to Moment Living. I envisioned it as a textbook, a collection of reflections to take us back to the preciousness of the moment, which is really all we have. Since I'm not sure when or if this book will be written, at least on Earth, it seems like a good idea to explore this theme in the present moment. Let's be here now. In Buddhism, the path to greater sensitivity in the present moment is achieved through mindfulness practice. There are many forms of this practice, and the root of them all is breath meditation, which in the local Pali of the Buddha's time, a derivative of Sanskrit, is called anapanasati, in-breath, out-breath, awareness. It's really the foundation for all other work on the Buddhist path, and it is a powerful tool to develop concentration and one-pointedness. As those who meditate know, it's almost always difficult to stay focused on a single object, our breath, or anything else, as countless distractions of thought, image, and feeling get in the way. Yet, if we cannot simply watch our breath in a quiet way, how can we expect to be clear and discerning in daily life, which is all the more complex? This is exactly the problem most people face. Unable to rest and be still while alone, we are not truly present with others. This is a big problem, and the only solution I have found is formal meditation practice, according to some mystic tradition. At the start, before we can sing the virtues of wakefulness, which is the core of Buddhism, as even the word Buddha means one who has awakened, we need to acknowledge the basic condition in which we find ourselves most of the time. What is the diagnosis? Unfortunately, human minds are generally speedy and distracted, unfocused and unsettled, never resting, and always jumping from thought to thought. To borrow a phrase from Buddhism, we have to acknowledge the monkey mind before we can liberate it. Another thing we'll see right away is one element of the Buddha's Four Noble Truths, the fact that all conditioned things are impermanent. Looking deeper, we'll also find that this perpetual restless mind is itself tied to suffering what the Buddha called dukkha, or dissatisfaction, or stress. With this kind of calm observation, we can see that everything in the mind naturally changes, shifts, and flows, and never remains solid. It's our desire to keep things the same, leading to grasping, both subtle and coarse, that is at the root of this dukkha. Mental grasping is perhaps the most profound and pervasive quality of the non-enlightened mind. It is the root tendency that leads to our commonly accepted sense of separated self. As such, it's also the root of all ignorance. While the ordinary mind jumps from thought to thought, from memory to fantasy to feeling, at a preconscious or precognitive level, we're left with only the bitter aftertaste of loss, the inevitable slipping away of all we cannot hold and preserve. Though it may be unpleasant, the first step towards learning how to be here now requires us to steep ourselves in the curdled milk of mental turmoil, not to be masochistic, but to get familiar with the way things normally are. Like it or not, this tumult, loud or soft, is where we usually live. If we think it is otherwise, it's probably because we're not looking hard enough at the raw quality of moment-to-moment -moment experience. If you don't believe me, try an hour of sitting with your breath. At advanced stages of meditation, we can observe even more subtle levels of dissatisfaction. And so it is said, only a Buddha is truly happy. Of course, this may seem pessimistic, but from meditation experience, I've learned that ordinary mind indeed knows no rest. But more than that, the harder I look in mind for something to hold on to, the more everything recedes. Ultimately, all that we try to grasp slips away which is another basic Buddhist truth expressed by the Buddha and leads us to appreciate the value of non-attachment. In particular, it's taught that the way to freedom from suffering, impermanence, and monkey mind is through non-grasping, learning to rest in spacious mind, and ultimately realizing the illusory nature of the mental process itself. But again, such advice means little or nothing unless we have the stability of mind to listen and receive the willingness and desire to understand exactly how to quell our confused mental process and reverse the age-old patterns of ceaseless grasping. Here again, we see the necessity of formal meditation. Bear in mind, this is an extremely subtle process, 
as we can only use the grasping mind to teach the grasping mind how to be comfortable without any more grasping. But fortunately, we can develop stability and concentration through careful awareness in daily life. Only then can the subtle splendors all around us be revealed. Moment-to-moment -moment living means taking one step at a time, one situation at a time, flowing from relation to relation, engagement to engagement, from present focus to next present focus. The irony here is that the ordinary life already expresses just this flow. Whether we are clear or not, we do travel the path of life from moment to moment. While we can certainly influence our road and some of the scenery around us, a process we can learn in weekend seminars on manifesting abundance, it seems more important to direct our efforts to knowing the one who is taking this grand journey. Who is it that manifests anything? This kind of self-work, I mean, leading to a deepened appreciation of the moment, a sense of greater potential and creative response, is based upon both self-reflection and wholehearted engagement. Zen Buddhism expresses this kind of engagement in the most simple terms. When you drink tea, drink tea. It doesn't mean we have to kill our thinking, which is actually impossible, but rather jump wholly into experience. When we give ourselves to the moment without reserve, we can experience a vibrancy and contact intensity that, in its purest form, becomes or is full enlightenment. To give oneself to the moment is to forget the self, and to forget the self is to drop habitual grasping through thought, checking, and emotion. In this way, we actually free ourselves from an illusory stream of mental activity and begin to see through our normal patterns of self-definition all of which proceed from the very understandable assumption that my psychological process is real and solid. In Buddhism, the only philosophy I know of that swallows its own tail, the ordinary sense of self or ego is considered a totally empty notion, the first and primary delusion that keeps us in dukkha. Their view is that only the formless, essentially bright mind source is real. Furthermore, Ra says the same thing. They consider most everything a distortion of the law of one. For them, only oneness is real. Everything else is a measure of misperception. Again, unless you enter deep meditation, it's hard to understand this insight. The second part of mindfulness, which complements wholehearted external engagement, is self-reflection and sensitivity to what arises internally each moment. Although strict Buddhists might consider this a fall back to fantasy, since it involves a form-bound focus on my feelings, my process, and my needs, keeping alive the notion of an apparently real ego, it's still a useful approach to greater understanding. Although this kind of practice assumes that the various elements of psychological experience are solid, i.e. I and my feelings are real, and would probably be considered a delusion by some of the die-hard Zen masters who teach non-duality by shouts and screams, Nevertheless, it's like removing poison with poison, using dualistic mind to gain some greater freedom from itself. Despite these limitations, this approach helps us understand and identify our personal process in the moment, which is a good first step that can help generate more kindness and self-compassion. Such self-reflection can open the heart, develop reflexive self-acceptance, and ultimately help us dissolve attachment to these very same thoughts feelings, and beliefs. Though we may still believe in ego and a separate self-sense, which just means we're not yet Buddhas, the energy of love that comes from really being willing to feel ourselves fully has a tremendous transformative effect. Centuries ago, the Rai Chinese Buddhists said, if you meet the Buddha in the road, kill him right away. Today, applied to our more humble self-healing, we could also say, when you greet turmoil, confusion, and pain, love them fully. When we meet the so-called ego with unconditional acceptance, it actually dissolves, since it's just a mirage anyway. It's a product of having believed in our normal 3D senses for many lifetimes, of assuming that our ordinary perceptions of duality and subject-object splitting are real. Again, from the perspective of oneness or the law of one, so-called emptiness, there is no solid me and my feelings. There is only the flow of the great infinite nameless. This is no different from the Tao, as described by Lao Tzu, 
author of the Chinese Taoist classic, Tao Te Ching, also called The Way and Its Power. It's the great mystery that can only be entered beyond all conceptual thought. Living this reality is living full enlightenment. For those of us who are wanderers, this perspective helps us acknowledge that the apparent duality we live amidst in 3D is just an illusion, which may ameliorate some of the discomfort of this alien environment. And you thought you were the alien. It can also help us develop a more focus, more disciplined sensitivity to bring our power back inside. If you want to be free of all the pain of 3D duality, then pay closer attention to your own mind. We cannot be at ease in a world full of strife and conflict when our inner world is just the same. We cannot achieve balance if we do not have silence of mind, and we cannot do too much real service when we're stuck in our own personal process. Of course, you don't have to be from elsewhere to make use of the teachings of wholehearted engagement and thorough self-reflection. Et or otherwise, we all live in the now. As Ra once noted, the moment contains love, which means that cosmic love is the basis for our freely chosen experience, and the potential for loving action is ever present. In fact, when we're really clear and present, free-floating love and basic goodness can be felt as the matrix of each moment. True human nature, what Ra calls the mystery-clad being, has its source in the freedom to choose and grow as we please. Whether we appreciate this or not, this also is our choice. What is precious in the moment can only be seen with eyes of light, perception truly free of attachment to thought, feeling, and belief. Our ordinary ways of grasping, keeping us from simple presence, are born of a subtle sense of separation, attachment not really to a solid ego, but to the apparently solid idea of what we call ego. In my experience, it's only through deeper meditation, calm, and insight that we can come to see how subtle and far-reaching is our sense of separation from all that is. The sense of separation is no different from the sense of ego, and this basic existential split is the root of all suffering and illusion, according to Buddhists. All mystic traditions speak of unity, identifying higher self as true self, and teach that true self is one with infinite Godhead. The supreme mystery of being, as the basis of so many religions, we've all heard these ideas before. But hearing is not enough. In practice, the path of living unity is lived moment to moment. Each moment is like a crossroads in which we can be clear or confused, present or absent, wavering or firm. In this very moment, we forge our fate, and as usual, it all depends on our fortitude, awareness. And will to be. Over 1,000 years ago, the great Chinese Chan teacher Lin Chi, founder of the Rinzai School of Zen Buddhism, said the same thing. Quote, "Students today can't get anywhere. What ails you? Lack of faith in yourself is what ails you. If you lack faith in yourself, you'll keep tumbling along, bewilderedly following after all kinds of circumstances, and never be yourself. There is only the man of the way." Listening to my discourse, dependent upon nothing, he it is who is the mother of all Buddhas. Make yourself master everywhere, and wherever you stand is the true place. It all comes back to us, and we all come back to now.